the next talk is uh, from John Grork, who has focused on a population uh, in cardiology that is increasing in size, uh, the uh, survivors of uh, oncologic therapy. And John's going to highlight some of the ways in which this population can inform uh, clinical and translational work in the rest of cardiology. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you today on cardiovascular risk in cancer survivors. As you've just heard, my clinical and research interest is in the field of cardio-oncology. This is a growing field that focuses on improving the cardiovascular health of cancer patients. And it was during my work as a cardio-oncologist that I met a patient called Sarah. Sarah was a 53-year-old working mother of three who had just returned from Paris with, where she had been with her husband to celebrate the three-year anniversary of completing chemotherapy for breast cancer. I met her a day after she had a large heart attack that was complicated by cardiogenic shock. Unfortunately, while she had won the battle against cancer, she lost the war against cardiovascular disease and she died a week later. During those last few days, she was so frustrated by how unfair it seemed to have beaten cancer and then so soon afterwards for this to happen. She asked me why she had had a heart attack. And when I explained to her that cancer survivors are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease, she was shocked not to have heard that before. She really resented the opportunities for her to reduce her um, cardiovascular risk. And it's because of Sarah and patients like Sarah that I have focused on strategies to improve the cardiovascular health of cancer patients. Over the next few minutes, I will discuss the growing population of cancer survivors who are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. I, we will learn that impaired ex exercise capacity is particularly common in this cohort of patients and that this has prognostic relevance. I will propose tailored oncocardiac rehabilitation as a, a mechanism for reducing risk in these patients, and then more briefly discuss the key challenges and opportunities within the field of cardio-oncology. The ugly reality is that two out of every five people in this room will be diagnosed with cancer at some point during their lifetime. This graph illustrates the increase in cases of cancer in all age groups and in both sexes over the coming years. Fortunately, because of earlier detection and better cancer treatments, the overall five-year survival for invasive cancers has significantly improved in recent years, such that we now have over 15 and a half million cancer survivors living in the US today, and this population continues to grow each year. We now appreciate that cardiovascular disease is a major cause of morbidity and mortality among cancer survivors, and indeed competes with cancer as a leading cause of death in this population. So we truly do have a growing population of cancer survivors who are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Research has shown that impaired exercise capacity is particularly common among cancer survivors. But does this have prognostic implications? Before I answer that question, I want to remind you how we as cardiologists quantify exercise capacity. We use METs, or metabolic equivalents. A single MET is defined as the energy that is required while sitting at rest. So sitting there is a one MET activity. Walking briskly is a five MET activity, or requires five times the energy that is expended at rest. Jogging is a seven met activity, running a nine minute mile is an 11 met activity, and the golfers among you will be disappointed to learn that golf is a four met activity, which is roughly on par with vacuuming. <laughs> so now that we're all familiar with metabolic equivalents, I would like to return to that question as to whether exercise limitation that is prevalent among cancer survivors influences outcomes. As part of my research, I've studied over 1,600 cancer survivors who underwent a stress test at Brigham and Women's Hospital. The median interval from cancer diagnosis to stress test was seven years. On this graph, I have plotted the probability of all-cause death according to category of exercise capacity. You will see that the risk of death over follow-up is highest among cancer survivors who have poor exercise capacity who completed just less than five METs on the treadmill whereas the risk of death is lowest among cancer survivors who have good exercise capacity who managed over eight METs on the treadmill. When you adjust for potential confounders, every one MET increase in exercise capacity is associated with a 25% reduction in risk of all-cause death, a 17% reduction in risk of cardiovascular death, and a 26% reduction in risk of cancer death. 
This research has also shown that a history of chemotherapy or radiation to above the level of the diaphragm was associated with a two-fold increased risk of poor exercise capacity in cancer survivors. So I'm standing here telling you that exercise is a good thing. That's hardly novel. But I think um, emphasizing the importance of improving fitness in cancer survivors warrants particular focus because for starters they have an increased prevalence of impaired exercise capacity as we've just seen and this they are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease and improving exercise capacity has the potential to improve cancer and cardiovascular outcomes in this population. So how can we improve fitness in cancer survivors? I think we can learn a lot from the model of cardiac rehabilitation that's employed in patients who undergo cardiac surgery, such as bypass surgery, valve surgery, or stents. Um, the benefits of cardiac rehabilitation in those populations is well proven, including a 20 to 30% reduction in risk of all-cause mortality and increased exercise performance. So if a patient merits cardiac rehab after valve surgery or a coronary stent, why not after several months of chemoradiation therapy that has re resulted in significant reductions in exercise capacity and significant physical deconditioning? I propose that select cancer patients should undergo a program of oncocardiac rehabilitation. These patients will be particularly deconditioned as a result of their cancer and their treatment. And it would happen following completion of their therapies. What would it look like? It would involve individualized exercise prescription that would take into account current or prior exercise behaviors. It would provide an opportunity to educate these patients that they are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease and allow for assessment and optimization of cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension and hyperlipidemia that have taken a back seat during their cancer care. Nutritional advice would be important and an opportunity for psychological rehab to help these patients graduate to survivorship. I think there's tremendous opportunity to provide hospital and community-based cardio -onco or oncocardiac rehabilitation. There's also significant potential to develop web-based platforms and app-based technologies that could offer variations of this program. And I would envisage programs being offered, or variations of this program being offered by private gyms and perhaps by large employers for their employees who have a history of cancer. But this is only a single example of a lifestyle intervention that can improve the cardiovascular health of cancer patients. We at the Brigham are working on many other strategies in the field of cardio-oncology with a common goal of protecting and improving cardiovascular health of cancer patients. And I would like to highlight the two biggest challenges that we have in this field of cardio-oncology. Number one is that we have an incomplete understanding of the true cardiovascular risk of many cancer therapies and of the mechanisms that underscore these cardiotoxicities. For example, why is chemotherapy associated with a two-fold increased risk of impaired exercise capacity seven years later among cancer survivors? Secondly, because of these knowledge gaps, we have been undermined in our ability to develop effective strategies for, cardiac, for cardio protection. These challenges offer significant opportunities for us as cardiologists to partner with industry to improve design of clinical trials of cancer therapies, to include adequate cardiovascular surveillance and adjudication of cardiovascular events, and to design and perform adequately powered clinical trials of cardioprotection strategies to mitigate cardiovascular toxicities of culprit cancer therapies. So in summary, we have a growing population of cancer survivors who are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And we as a medical community have a responsibility to develop effective strategies to tackle that increased risk. I've shown you a single example of a lifestyle interven intervention in the form of oncocardiac rehabilitation. But there is tremendous need and opportunity to develop other um, pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions to tackle this increased risk in this population. We need to work together so that we can more safely deliver our modern day very effective cancer therapies so that stories like Sarah's is replaced by stories of enduring and meaningful survivorship. Thank you very much.